tape was rolling and I felt safe hanging off the side of the boat filming. Looking through the viewfinder, I saw the rod slam down horizontal and could hear the bait alarm squealing. I slowly tilted up the camera off the stern and in the picture was a white marlin piercing through the top of a 15-foot wave clearing the air by 5 feet. The airborne thrashing marlin was now 20 feet above the trough of the wave. Wow! What a sight! And caught live on camera. Watching the marlin begin to crash down back into the sea, in my mind, the very first beat of the soundtrack was getting ready to fire off. The first two notes of this music were 48 tracks of guitar, synths, and an orchestra, all firing off 300 voices at the same time with enough musical force to knock down a wall. When that marlin hit the water, it was in perfect sync with the soundtrack in my mind. What I had planned many weeks ago was now playing real-time in the ocean with a 15-foot sea and a white marlin that was half fish and half airplane. I never saw a fish jump like this. This marlin, to me, was king of the sea. Next, the 55 sports fish fell off atop of a huge wave and was then down in the trough. This monster wave rolled under us and then off the stern. As it passed about 20 yards away, the panicked marlin jumped through the top of the wave, dancing in an acrobatic way, throwing its bill, trying to free itself. The footage was unreal, and tape was rolling. After about 15 minutes of filming, I repositioned three other times to continue to get the shots I wanted. Trick was in awe of this fish, and with the excitement of the sea conditions, made everyone's hair stand on end. Off the northeast port side, the dark skies plummeted down to the tips of the waves and there emerged a wide water spout. The ocean and cloud sky above us was now connected and the white marlin was racing through the tops of the waves like a bat out of hell. The captain pointed the boat southwest to divert from the water spout. Unfortunately, the spout did not help the sea conditions any. The captain had the second mate haul in the outriggers, fearing that they were getting too close to the crest of the waves. After the outriggers were secured, I attempted to get the mate to hold the camera and I was going to try and get an interview with Trick while he was fighting the fish. This did not work. In these conditions, it was not wise to turn over this piece of camera gear to anyone. I called up on the intercom to the captain from below and told him that I was going to be doing some things with the camera in the back and not to be concerned. I would have a safety line on me the entire time. This was an opportunity to get some once-in-a-lifetime footage, and I was going to get it. The captain replied on the intercom, Jim, that is fine, but be careful, and also pass this on to the crew below. I have been on the VHF, and there is a charter boat from the Northern Fleet that is beginning to take on water. The Coast Guard has been notified, and we are now heading in that direction in case they need assistance. We are on standby. If I flash the floodlights three times, that means lines in immediately. Try to get that fish in ASAP. I replied, okay, Captain. We'll keep an eye on the floods. By the way, your bilge lights keep coming on down here on the circuit breaker panel. Captain said, that's fine, Jim. We have a staged bilge system, and that is just the service pump. No problem. I said, Captain, all three bilge lights are on. Do you have three service pumps? Captain flew downstairs, waved me aside, and opened the flooded engine compartment. The raw water intake to the engine had come loose, and the boat was flooding with water. He quickly secured the hose by reclamping the seacock with two clamps. Then the captain hit the switch to the mother of all bilge pumps. This thing could have raised the Titanic. After the water was pumped out, the captain flew back up the ladder to the flybridge just in time for the port side canvas to rip off. This let a lot of spray into the flybridge, however, was not going to stop the captain from fishing. I repositioned myself on the stern and tied a line onto me to a secured cleat. Then I laid on the floor on the back deck with the camera pointing upwards. The sea would slide me around the back deck, which would enable me to get some incredible angle shots of reeling in the white marlin. This camera angle was also an interesting perspective of the massive waves that seemed to engulf us. This worked for about 15 minutes before my safety line broke and decided it was time to get shots from the flybridge. This is where I would film the remaining of the marlin sequence. The marlin was jumping directly behind the stern, which is always a dangerous situation. P. 
people get stabbed and sometimes even pulled over when the fish gets this close. It was only two weeks prior when a mate fishing offshore Hatteras was pulled over by a marlin. He got caught up in the line. The marlin dove and pulled the mate overboard. He was never seen again. These things do happen and did not want it happening to us. I told the captain that I had 20 minutes of footage and most of it was usable. The seas were building more and I told him to do a quick release of the fish and we would be done. The mate released the marlin unharmed and as the last roller moved beneath our boat, the freed marlin spiked through a wave and gave us one last frantic poetic dance. The marlin fell back crashing against the sea in a trough. Then his bill fenced across the waves for a moment while quickly submerging beneath a vast enraged sea blanketed by rain. That was the last we saw of that magnificent fish. He pointed the boat northwest and headed in. The other boat in the northern fleet that was taking on water was escorted in by the Coast Guard and returned safely. The inlet at Hatteras is one of the most dangerous in the world. There is a reason why they call this area the graveyard of the Mid-Atlantic. Even in the 55 sports fish, we cavitated the port prop as we made the south turn in the inlet. We hit a wave broadside and threw the boat on its side like it was a puffer sailboat. My knees would continue to stay blue until we were steady in the sound. We were finally out of the Atlantic. The magnolia tree had blessed us once more. Back at the dock, Wayne was still passed out. I figured it was a combination of food poisoning and seasickness. By the time the boat was cleaned up, the day was shot. We would stay one more night in Hatteras Village before heading back. The captain asked me if we wanted to stop by his favorite local bar for some fresh bluefin tuna. He had caught this fish and wanted the bar to cook it up and celebrate the day's shoot. We took Wayne to the room where he continued to rest and hopefully get better. I went down the street to meet the captain at the sandbar for drinks and fresh tuna. I also brought my camera to show him some of the footage. We ordered several drinks because it had been an extremely rough day out at sea. I explained to the captain the soundtrack I had written for this marlin shoot and just how awesome the footage was going to work with the music I had written. I was very excited about editing this show, more so than any other show I had produced so far. The captain was very gracious and he knew that the footage we got was fairly rare for those days. I knew I was sitting on film that, once edited, was going to drive our viewers nuts with excitement. We would be the talk of the town for years. At least, that is what I thought. The next day, we got up, and Wayne was still in horrible shape. And this is when I began to think something might be seriously wrong with him. In my biz, people get seasick and eat bad food on the road all the time. It happens frequently, but this now seemed to be something much more. On the road traveling north on the outer banks, the waves were still crashing the shoreline. I thought to myself, I was so grateful the marlin gave us such a good show, then was set free to live its life in the ocean. The anticipation of editing this show was killing me. Worrying about Wayne, I called his girlfriend and told her about his illness. I explained that we thought it was food poisoning and seasickness, however, now I was thinking it could be something else. I told her, I am bringing him to you, and I want you to keep a close eye on him. I am worried that something is going on, but I don't know what. She appreciated it, and said she would take care of him and keep a watchful eye. I drove Wayne to his girlfriend's, and his condition worsened. He could hardly get out of the truck. Things were not looking good. She said to put him on the sofa, and she would watch him and see how he does. She said there was a medical center close to her house and she would take him there if necessary. She said for me to go home, get some rest, and if there were any change, she would call me. I got a call at 8 p.m. that night from her saying that Wayne was taken in an ambulance and was in the hospital. She had left him on the sofa and he was awake but not feeling well. She took a shower. When she came out, Wayne was passed out and could not be wakened. He was breathing, but she said he had gotten very white and would not wake. She called her nursing friend and then an ambulance. I rushed to the hospital to see Wayne and was worried to death. After several tests, the doctors found out Wayne had a severe case of diverticulitis and could have easily died. They rushed him to surgery where he remained in the hospital for a month. 
He was going to survive this. However, he would continue to have complications for the next year. My good friend Wayne lost 70 pounds during this ordeal, and I was extremely happy that he had lived through it. All of us were grateful that he survived, and none of us thought it was Wayne's time to go. The magnolia tree had blossomed once more. Wayne's illness distracted me greatly, and I was not able to edit the Marlin show for about two months. Once I had my head clear, I was ready to concentrate on editing. I had a very dramatic, original soundtrack, high-impact, exciting Marlin footage that together was going to make the best fishing episode on TV. I was excited. I locked myself into the studio and began to edit the show. The footage was so thrilling that the entire story about filming this offshore excursion was going to take up about 15 minutes of edited program material, enough to almost make an entire show. For 15 hours, I edited that footage, syncing it up to every beat of the soundtrack I had produced. Once done, I then would preview it and look for places that I could add sound effects, tweak the audio, balance the video, and just polish this feature segment until it was perfect. I left the editing alone for two days. I wanted to be able to take a fresh look at the segment before I finished. I fired up the studio, cranked everything up, and sat in front of my main studio television monitor with an Alesis audio reference monitor to my left and one to the right. I was sitting dead center of the stereo field. I hit enter on my editor, sat back to watch the smiling feature I had edited. Oh, wow. This is good shit. The music, the marlin jumping out of 15-foot seas, the dark sky. I just knew that it was going to blow everyone's socks right off. I was so proud of what we had accomplished. The footage and the soundtrack together were better than anything else I ever seen on any outdoor program. This was going to be big, I thought. There was one little problem, though. I did not have enough footage to finish the show, so I needed a filler segment to complete the program. The previous Thanksgiving, we shot a little segment in my backyard overlooking the lake about how to deep fry a turkey. It was a simple little piece that was one take with me just talking about the deep fryer and a few tips on how best to deep fry turkeys. The good thing was that the little cooking segment was only about three minutes and fit perfectly at the end of the Marlin episode. By including the deep fried turkey cooking segment, the Marlin show would be completed and ready for air. I could have this feature airing on national TV in one month. Okay, turkey segment is in. I want the show to air ASAP because I was so excited about how it turned out. One of the magazines I wrote for needed a column for the next issue, so I wrote all about this Marlin program and also sent a press release promoting this show everywhere I could. In my glory and excitement, I was ready to change my name to Ahab, Quint, or Ernest. A month later, the Marlin show airs in national syndication. I remember watching it live on air and just so happy with how it turned out. I was a little put off that I had to put a turkey segment at the end of such dramatic footage. But other than that, this show was killer. I was so happy sitting there watching it having several cocktails. When the show ended, I was done and ready for bed. I accomplished producing the best saltwater feature I had ever done and better than anything I had ever seen on TV at that time. I was ready for the accolades. I slept in late the next day. Once up and coffee in me, I thought I would go to the studio and check to see if I got any email or phone calls about the Marlin program that aired the night before. When I walked in the studio, the light was flashing on my answering machine, and it said it had 15 messages. I did not check them yet. Turning on my office computer, I was thinking I might have a few emails regarding the Marlin feature. Once logged on to my email account, here it comes, over 100 emails about the Marlin show. I thought, man, I must have been right about that footage. The best. I quickly reviewed all the emails. Three emails talked about the great marlin fishing. That was it. 98 plus emails all asked for more information on how to cook a turkey. What the hell? I could not believe what I was reading. Hey, Jim, what kind of oil did you use? Jim, do you ever get the oil too hot and have it blow over the pot? 
Jim, can you inject the turkey and fry it as well? Jim, how long did you say you cook it for? Does the bird have to be fresh? Jim, how big of a turkey can you put in that pot? Can you reuse the oil? Can you reuse the oil? Jim, can you do this during the winter? Jim, can you do this during the winter? What was the name of the company that makes your fryer? Jim, will you come over and deep fry a turkey for me? You get the idea. Even years later, people would come up to me and ask me about deep frying birds. Never about the marlin footage we almost died trying to get. This made me realize that viewers are incredibly interested in our cooking segments. This, of course, made a big change in how we produce our program. From then on, most every show would have a cooking segment, and I would also start writing cooking columns in various magazines. Eventually, I would also have a galley blog site that was featured on our Jim Baugh Outdoors main webpage in a cooking DVD. I thought about it for a long time, why we never got the response I thought we would from that incredible Marlin show. For years, I would ask viewers if they ever saw that episode, and lots of times I would get a, yeah, man, really cool, especially that deep fried turkey at the end. I asked this to one fellow. So, you like the turkey better than the marlin? He replied, The marlin was great, but it was like a video version of a Hemingway novel. It was really cool, but not something I think I would ever get to do. So, I said, So you may not often get the chance to hook up on a white marlin in a 15-foot sea, but you can enjoy frying a turkey in your backyard any day of the week. He said, That's right. But we really did enjoy the great marlin you caught. Hey, by the way, what kind of oil did you say you use when fry that thing? For me, this was like a light bulb that went off in my head. Produce outdoor television segments that feature a lot of things that people can relate to in their daily lives. For fishing, that would mean not a lot of offshore angling. More like bottom fishing in the bay, surf fishing, tidal fishing, etc. This would be a good strategy that still would allow us to do big offshore features, just not as many as we had done in the past. Overall, this would provide a better balance for our type of program, and it showed in the ratings. The truth is this. Never in my wildest dreams would I have thought an 80-pound thrashing white marlin would get upstaged by a backyard 10-pound fried turkey. Who knew?